late today. I apologize for being a bit late. Um, just had to had to kind of clear out the zone so there's no uh, disruptions here. Number one, and number two, I gotta look over my notes because the notes were great on Friday, but then I realized I haven't looked at them since then, so they're a little scattered. Plus, over Shabbos, I was researching the subject I wanted to talk about, and I found some other amazing ideas that I, please God, look forward to sharing. So I had to kind of find where they fit in my notes. You know, I take it very seriously. When I talk to y'all here, I always want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. I'm prepared. I'm, I'm ready to go. And I don't want to come here and start, uh, you know, spitballing and, you know, just guesstimating and ballparking. That's not, y'all deserve more than that. You should have that, uh, you know, the teacher comes prepared. If you're going to give me your attention and your time. Uh, I want to make it worth your while. <clears throat> Anyhow, that's just my philosophy. So, um, I do have a question for you, Rabbi. Go ahead, shoot, David. Um, because you can't write on Shabbos, do you have a system for when you're studying for like, in instead of underlining or highlighting or whatever, do you have a, a good system that you follow? Oh, yeah. So my, my go-to system for for how to take notes on Shabbos is that I have a lot of paper clips and I stick them in like if I'm reading a book and a book has something that is important for me to remember I want to integrate it into my notes and so on I will just put a little paper clip on the spot where you know where that citation is and then after Shabbos I can kind of go to the computer put it into the notes that's my go-to system. Gotcha. Um, he, and actually, in in uh, in uh, in Houston, I have my uh, I have I have like thousands of paper clips, and I got them all over the house. And every book has paper clips in it because sometimes I, I I take notes and I say, oh, I'll eventually add it to my notes. So I have a, a whole book and it's got fifty paper clips in all these different spots. And then on occasion, I say, okay, I'm gonna sit down and kind of pull all those. Go revisit all those spots and find if I still want to remember that thing, or maybe it was just something I put in, but I don't really want to, you know, spend time in it, work on finding out where in my notes it fits in, you know, cause I have, thank God, I have like thousands of different documents um, in, in all my notes for all these different subjects that I'm working on. So sometimes I have a document and I've been working on it for five years, you know, sporadically, episodically, and then we'll do a podcast about it, you know, five years later. So I'm like, oh, I remember I want I wanted to talk about this sometime. So I just okay, I found some nothing some something interesting about that. Let me put it into those notes eventually. I'll sit down and organize it and you know structure it properly and see if it's something you know valuable for y'all to uh to hear. <clears throat> so that's that's how the system really works. That's how we make the sausage. <laughs> kosher, kosher sausage. Of course. Okay, so let's begin. We'll, uh, I guess we'll do like we do every week. We'll have everyone go on mute, and then we'll have the class, and then and then we'll uh, have questions. Is that okay? That's okay. Okay, let us begin. We are amidst the part of the year where many tragedies have befallen our people. We are amidst the what's known as the three weeks that span two fast days, the 17th day of Tammuz. That was the day that the walls of Jerusalem were breached. And many other tragedies happened on the 17th day of Tammuz. And then the end cap of that, the other bookend of that, is of course the ninth day of the month of Av. And that's when the temple was destroyed, both the first temple and the second temple. Many other tragedies happened on these days. Uh, the First terrible event that happened on the 17th day of Thomas was the golden calf. Jewish people, you know, a little more than a month after the sign of relation, they do something which amounts on some level to idolatry. They want a replacement for Moshe, but it kind of spirals out of control and becomes like a replacement for God on some level. It's a disaster. Moshe comes down from the mountain. He sees the revelry and the celebrations around the golden calf. He shatters the tablets and things kind of had head downhill, and that day becomes a day designated for misfortune and tragedy. 
The first ninth of Av, that is the day that the spies came back from the land. The scouts, the ostensibly righteous scouts that Moshe had commissioned to go scout the land, they come back with a devastating report. We won't be able to conquer the land. The defenses are too formidable for us. The people are so are so muscular and big and fearsome. We have to go back to Egypt. Let's appoint ahead and return to Egypt. And Joshua and Caleb are fighting. No, no, we'll do it. And everyone starts crying. And they cry needlessly. And the Almighty, so to speak, says, okay, you cried needlessly on this day. This will be a day that you'll have very good reason to cry. And that day has been designated for, for tragedy, for misfortune, and for all sorts of, uh, of terrible events ever, ever since. But as you just tell us that quite counterintuitively, on the day of Tisha B'Av, on the worst day of the calendar, that's when Messiah is born. And there's like this silver lining that amidst the tragedy, amidst the, the, the worst calamity, there'll be that little spark, the little sprout that will eventually fix it all, remedy it all, and turn Tisha B'Av into a happy day. And therefore, this time of year, we're, we're thinking about what, what can we do to kind of flip the script on these days and find ways to turn it into, into positivity. Now, as you know, we recently just concluded our wide-ranging study of the 13 Principles of Faith. We dedicated a long time in that pursuit. It was uh, five years and 77 episodes on the Torah on One podcast channel. And I'm sure all of y'all have really studied it very intensively. But there's a lot of different subjects that we didn't fully address and I have them in my notes as these are some things that I want to pursue. And I thought it would be a good, a good time today to study and to analyze and to ponder a very intriguing teaching in the Talmud relating to Messiah and specifically to the name of Messiah. There's a teaching in the Talmud. And if you read it, there's no way to read it without acknowledging that there's something very deep and very mysterious about it. It deals with some of the most profound and foundational aspects of life, of Torah, of the world, of creation. And anyone who reads it knows immediately it's a mystery. And we will acknowledge that it is, it is a mystery. It will remain a mystery. But I thought it would be worthwhile to bite off some parts of it and see what we can learn. The Talmud tells us in the book of Psachim on page 54a, Seven things were created before the world was created. We know, of course, Genesis chapter 1, it describes the events of creation. Genesis. Before creation, it was just God. And God, for whatever reason, decided at some point to make a creation. And we have a version of that and a description of that in chapter 1 of Genesis. No one will argue it's a comprehensive description. There's a lot of things that are not addressed. But the Talmud tells us that there are seven creations that were created before Genesis. Before Genesis chapter 1. Before the world was created. Now that notion should right away pique our interest. Like what, what does this even mean? A creation before creation. And we read this list, we find some very important elements of our philosophy, of our theology, of our eschatology. It right away gets our attention. These seven themes are, number one, Torah. Torah is a creation of God. But it's a very early creation of God. It preceded the world. The next one is tshuva, repentance. Repentance is a creation of God that preceded the world. Number three, Gan Eden, paradise. Number four, Gehenna, purgatory. Number five, Kisei HaKavod, the throne of glory. 
What that means? I don't know. I'm just reading, reading what the Talmud says. Number six, Beis Hamikdash, the Holy Temple. And number seven, this is what we will primarily focus upon. Number seven, Shmo Shel Mashiach, the name of Mashiach. Now, each one of these seven themes, the Talmud brings a verse to describe or, or to prove this claim that they preceded the world. So each one of these things has a verse that says, well, this came before the world. For example, the verse, we're going to focus on, focus on Messiah. The verse that the Talmud brings to support the claim that Messiah preceded, or the name of Messiah preceded the world, the verse says in Scripture, Lifne Shemesh, before the sun, Yinon Shemo. His name is Yinon. Yinon is one of the names of Messiah, as we shall see. And it came, Lifne Shemesh, before the sun, i.e. before the world. But what I want to focus on is, you know, we've talked about this, how the Torah precedes the world. When it's repentance time, we often focus on the fact that repentance preceded the world and why it has to be like that. And why it has to be like that. It's almost, uh, we suggest, that the world, once it's created, cannot really tolerate the idea of repentance. Repentance is a, is a, is an idea that violates the rules of the world. And therefore, only because it was created before the world is it possible to endure. But what does it mean when the Talmud says that the name of Messiah precedes the world? First of all, what does the name of Messiah even mean? Is that like uh, the identifier Messiah? What's his name? What does it say in the passport or on the birth certificate? That would seem to be a very superficial understanding of what this, of what this Talmud is referring to. Why is it significant that it preceded the world? What's the lesson behind that? That's what I primarily want to focus on. But I want to begin more generally with this Talmud in its totality. The Rashba, that may not be a name that gets your attention, the Rashba is one of the greatest of the Medieval sages. So if you ever had the great privilege of spending time in yeshiva, you know that the, the name Rashba, his name is Rabbi Shlomo Benaderis, Rashba, that name is a name that's absolutely revered amongst our people. In the era of, of Rashi and the Rambam, Ramban, Rashba is a student of the Ramban. He's one of the absolute... Uh, uh, on the absolute pantheon of, of the greatest medieval sages of our of our history. And he has a piece on this Talmud. And he addresses every part of it. I think it's uh, it's valuable to hear what he has to say. What does it mean that there were themes that preceded the world? Seven themes came before the world. There were seven creations that were created before the world was created. Says the Rashba, this is the plan. When you have something that you want to achieve, you have a goal, you want to bring about a certain ends, you always have to have at the beginning, even before you start building it out, you have to know what the end looks like. So the, the first part of your plan should be indicative of the ultimate end of your project. You have to know what you want to get and you have to install that, so to speak, before you even start building out the components of, of your enterprise. So the Rashba says that this Talmud, this very mysterious Talmud, 17th trade for the world, a very interesting list of these seven things. This is telling us what the goal of the world is. Think about how advanced that question is. Like, why did the Almighty create the world? What's the purpose of it? What's the plan of creation? What's the goal? What's the ultimate endpoint? Says the Rashba, this is what the Talmud's addressing. The things that preceded the world, they are going to lay out for us a, a picture, a framework 
of what the goal of the world is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says that the goal of the world, it's really about man, point number one, and that man should be elevated, notwithstanding the fact that man is in a lowly world, and man is subjected to physicality in the Yetzirah, evil inclination and sin, man should elevate themselves and become like an angel, like the heavenly angels. That's the goal. Man who could be dragged down into the quagmire, into the morass of animalistic, impulsive behavior, man should be elevated and become angelic and refined and ethereal. And in order to achieve that, there were seven things placed in creation before anything was even created, before the arena, so to speak, was created. And number one, of course, is Torah. How, how do you expect man to know how to serve God and how to understand God and how to connect with the Creator? There has to be some sort of roadmap that's established in order to facilitate that. What to do, what not to do, what steps to follow in order to achieve that ultimate end state. And that's why Torah preceded the world. But of course, the system relies upon free will. Because it's not just that man becomes like an angel, but man earns that standing on their own. And there has to be the capacity of man choosing a different path. And the Almighty installed the concept of repentance in order to facilitate the, the, the returning to the path an on-ramp after someone maybe fell off the path. Humanity, we're capable of doing great things. We're, we're capable of becoming like angels and even greater than angels. But because we're always in the balance, we have the capacity of, of making mistakes, of erring. And when that happens, we have to have a way to get back. If everyone was just lost forever, beyond the point of no return with just one mistake, there would effectively be no one who achieves the goal of creation. And the Rosh cites a verse, there is no righteous person in the land that does good and doesn't sin. It's, it's not a possibility. You think about the, you know, just the, it's like flipping a coin and hitting heads a, a billion times. It's just not possible. Invariably, people will have some mistakes that they do. And therefore, part of the, of the structure of the system of creation demands the capacity for repentance. And it needs consequences. And that's why he explains we have to have Gan Eden, paradise, Gehenna, purgatory, Kisi Akavod, which he uses a lot of Kabbalistic terminology, and I don't really, frankly, understand what he's saying when he talks about what exactly it even means, the Kisi Akavod, the throne of glory. I can read you what it says. I can translate the words, but what does it actually mean? It's a, it's a mystery. He says that, that the 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 Kisya covered the throne of glory, that's the upper firmament that the lower world is dependent upon, relies upon, leans upon. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. But again, he's explaining that this would also be a necessary component of creation. And finally, the name of Messiah. What does creation look like? when the goal of creation has been actualized, that is the world of Messiah. In that time, he cites the verse, the land will be filled with knowledge of God as water covers the seabed. The world be, will be brimming with knowledge of God. 
And that plan, that vision, so to speak, preceded the world. The vision of what the world looks like when the goal of the world has been actualized, that is the name of Messiah. And he stresses, the Talmud does not say that Messiah preceded the world. But the name of Messiah, the concept, the picture of what it looks like, that idea was envisioned by God, so to speak, before the world, because the ultimate endpoint of the world is that. The ultimate goal, the ultimate ob objective is that. And that was established ahead of time, before creation. So we have, and I, again, an interpretation from the most reputable of sources. What does the Talmud mean? Well, the Talmud says that the name of Messiah saved the world it means that the goal of creation, not, not Messiah, the name of Messiah, the, the, the concept of Messiah, the world that will be actualized in the times of Messiah, that plan, that name, was installed ahead of time, before the world was created. That's how the, the Rashba interprets this Talmud. And that's, I think, it's, it's a very neat way of us remembering what it's all about. Sometimes, you know, you, you lose... The forest for the trees. You've heard that terminology. There's a lot of details, a lot of details. And sometimes you forget what's it all about. Here we have the Rashba telling us, again, the most reputable of sources. He's telling us that the goal of creation is going to be actualized in the times of Messiah when the whole world will be filled with knowledge of God as water covers the seabed and that was already installed. I that vision is already put in place, so to speak, before the creation of the world. And we hope, of course, to be meritorious, to be part of that, of that ultimate utopian world. So that's one way to interpret this Talmud. And what's remarkable about this, and this is what, what we see whenever we study these sorts of teachings in the Talmud, that there's so many different layers and dimensions and so many different ways to interpret it. We're not the type of people to say, well, this is the definitive one, certainly not when the sages offer different interpretations. We just want to we want to study it and, and understand that there's truth in all of these different interpretations. The Talmud Elsewhere. So that citation that we quoted was in the book of Psachim, we talked about Pesach, right? On page 54a. In the book of Sanhedrin, on page 98b, we read a very strange teaching. We have this concept called name of Messiah, which the Rashman tells us it's it's the it's it's the vision of the world when it is when it has achieved its perfection. The Talmud, in the book of Sanhedrin, page 98b, says, name of Messiah? What is the name of Messiah? It seems like it's trying to give us the answer. What is his name? Mashmo, what is his name? That's a fascinating question of the Talmud. And the answer is really intriguing. The Talmud says, well, every academy, every academy had a different answer to this question. In the academy of Rabbi Shiloh, the way they answer this question is that the name of Messiah is Shiloh. Ain't that a coincidence? In the academy of Rabbi Shiloh, they, they, they said, well, look at Look at uh, the sources, Scripture, Genesis chapter 49. It talks about the, the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons on his deathbed. And it talks about Messiah, and it calls Messiah Shiloh. So Shiloh must be the name of Messiah. Oh, just coincidentally, it's uh, also the name of our, the head of, the, of our academy. And then in the academy of Rabbi Yanai, they said, no, his name is Yinon. 
Yana Yinon is a very similar name. And in the academy of Rabbi Hanina, they said his name is Hanina. And by the way, this is not a coincidence. Rashi points out that each academy would try to study and say, well, is the name of the Messiah the same name as the head of our academy? So what is the name of Messiah? We have one opinion that it's Shiloh, it's Yinon, it's Hanina, or there are others that say it's Menachem. And yet there are others who say that the name of Messiah is the leper of the house of Rabbi Judah the Prince. Thus concludes the Talmud. Again, you 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 see you see a piece of Talmud and you right away understand that there's something beneath the surface. What actually is the name of Messiah? And it uses the same terminology or the same descriptor as this idea of name of Messiah that preceded the world. And we have five different answers. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still a little, still a little congested here. Well, this Canadian uh, summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So obviously, this raises questions of its own. What possessed each one of the sages to claim that? That are they claiming that their Messiah? Oh, just coincidentally, is the same name as theirs. And the Talmud seems to seems to say that there's some some degree of legitimacy in each one of these claims. The Talmud's not just saying, oh, you know, they spitballed, they argued that uh, it's Yana, it's Yinon, it's uh, Menachem, it's Hanina, it's Shiloh. When the Talmud recounts that, it's obviously, it's ascribing some degree of credibility to it. How can Messiah have so many different names? Should Messiah have, have one name? And what does it even mean that the, the Messiah is the leper of the house of Rabbi Judah the Prince? So obviously this Talmud is a, is a great mystery. I will point out that the four names that we are given here, uh, Menachem, Shiloh, Yinon, and Hanina, the first letter of each of each one of those four names, spell out the word Mashiach. Menachem is a Mem, Shiloh is a Shin, you know, as a yud, and Hanin is a ches. That spells out Mashiach. That's the Gona Vilna's observation that the name Mashiach is it's really a blend of these of these four names. Now to compound the matter, there's a um, a very famous line in the commentary of the Arachaim. The Arachaim is one of the preeminent commentators on the Torah written about 250 years ago. And in the book of Devarim chapter 15 verse 7 he's talking about Messiah and he says, oh Messiah his name is Chaim. So we have like you know, Messiah, is his name Shiloh? Is it Yenon? Is it is it uh, Menachem? Is it Hanina? Or maybe it's Chaim. Which in not coincidentally, is the name of the author of the Arachayim. His name was Chaim. And many of the commentaries on that commentary, they say, oh, he's referring to himself. So what does this possibly mean? So there's an idea that's found in a few different places. It's found in the response of the Chassam Sofer. For example. And he, he, he suggests, that's how he introduces this idea. I want to suggest a suggestion. Moshe was 80 years old and he had no idea that he was Moshe. And he knew his name was Moshe. But what did he do? He did the exodus and he split the sea and he did the templates and he brought the manna and he brought the Torah. You would think Moshe knew that, right? 
Did Moshe know that he was slated for that role? Moshe was the first Messiah. He was the first one who led, so to speak, the redemption of the nation. And he, he changed the trajectory of the world. And he himself had no idea that he was the redeemer of the, of the people. And God comes to him by the burning bush and says, well, it's time to go to Pharaoh. You go, you're going to save the Jewish people. And he spends a whole week launching objection after objection, saying why he's not qualified. Does Messiah know that he's Messiah? Says the Chassam Sofer, no. Messiah is not going to know that he's Messiah. The last Redeemer will be similar to the first Redeemer. Just as Moshe did not know that he's Messiah, so too Messiah will not know that he's Messiah. And then he says, from the, the day the temple was destroyed, because the, the temple could only coexist in a world of Messiah, so to speak. A world where, where God's present, presence is, is palpable in the world. Ever since the day of the destruction of the temple, there's always someone in the world who's alive, who is worthy to be the Redeemer. And they're not aware of it. But there, there's, there's someone who has that potential in the world at all times ever since the destruction. And when the other factors are in place, when the other conditions are, are in place for the redemption, then that person will be informed it's time and that spirit that was hidden within him and really comes from the upper spheres, that spirit of Messiah will be infused into this person and they'll be elevated head and shoulders above all of humanity and they will be brought to their, to their mission of Messiah. The temple was destroyed, you know, 1950 plus years ago. And for every single moment since then, there has been someone in the world who was capable of being Messiah. And should all the other factors of Messiah be in place, they will be endowed with the spirit of Messiah and they would be ushered, so to speak, to do what Messiah needs to do. But of course, the people have to be worthy. The generation has to be worthy. People have to, have to repent. People have to render themselves worthy of Messiah. And therefore, in every generation, there's someone that's around, and once the conditions are not, are not fitting for Messiah, they pass, and someone else fills their shoes. And therefore, when the Talmud says, what's the name of Messiah? We have answers. It's Shiloh, oh, like Rabbi Shiloh from the Academy of Rabbi Shiloh. Or Yane, like the Academy of Rabbi Yane. Or Hanina, like the Academy of Rabbi Hanina. Menachem. Those people have, have passed. What the Talmud is telling us is that in Rabbi Shiloh's generation, he was the potential Messiah. And had events been different, had the people been worthy of it, he would have been crowned as the Messiah and been informed, so to speak, of, of his mission, been given that spirit of Messiah, that elevated soul of Messiah, and changed the whole world. Each one of them can credibly claim to be Messiah in potential. And by the way, the Arachayim, he was a he was an absolute titan of his generation. And it's not unreasonable to claim that in his generation he was the potential Messiah. 
His name is Chaim. Yes, in his generation, his name is Chaim. Alas, it didn't quite work out. And therefore, the name of Messiah, according to this interpretation, is the identity of Messiah and the, the, the kind of the spiritual qualities of Messiah. And in every generation, that mantle is passed on to a different person. But it, the, the, the soul that's needed to... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> but the soul that's needed to bring about Messiah, that has been around and ready to go. That spirit, it's in place ever since before creation. So this is another interpretation of, of, of the Talmud. The name of Messiah precedes the world. The name of Messiah is, is representative of a, of, of a certain set of characteristics that makes a person worthy of doing the job to change the whole world and to usher in the era of Messiah. And that name is passed on from generation to generation, from one sage to another sage, and it's constantly changing because every generation is a different candidate. But there is someone who's around today who has the profile, the name of Messiah, so to speak, assigned to them. And should the events be such that it's 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 appropriate for Messiah to come right now, they will be given, so to speak, that heavenly component, that name of Messiah, that spirit of Messiah to help accelerate, so to speak, or, or to, to transform them into someone who can be the Moshe of the generation. They, they may not be aware of it. But there's someone around today who fits the bill. There's a third way to interpret this Talmud. The name of Messiah, not Messiah, the name of Messiah. That refers to the dimensions of Messiah, to the characteristics of Messiah, to the aspects of Messiah, to the elements of Messiah. Just as we know, Jethro had seven names. Moshe has ten names, we're told. A name is not just a way to identify who a person is, but it's indicative of a quality of a dimension, of an attribute. When the Talmud tells us, what is his name? Is it Shiloh? Is it Yinon? Is it Hanina? Is it Menachem? Is it the leper of the house of Rabbi the Prince? What it's telling us is that these five attributes, these five names, they are going to be part of the package of Messiah. So what does Shiloh mean? The word Shiloh can be read as Shiloh. Not the Civil War battle site. But two words, Shiloh. Shai means a gift. Lo means to him. Messiah will have such a worldwide renown and prestige and impact that all the nations will give gifts to Messiah. And that is hinted to, we're told, in the word Shiloh. A gift will be given to him. Shiloh. We have a very hard time, you know, analyzing our world. We have a very hard time imagining how the whole world can unite behind anything. We're not in the times of Messiah quite yet. One of the characteristics of Messiah is that every nation of the world will acknowledge and accept the dominion of Messiah to the degree they're going to want to give him gifts. So until you hear that the uh, Chinese and the Indians and the Australians and the Russians and the Europeans and the South Americans and the Africans and the Turks, they all agree and they all come to pay tribute to Messiah. We haven't quite unlocked the level of Messiah known as Shiloh. 
Now, the commentaries also note the word Shiloh, it means peace, like from the word Shalom. Another element of the Messiah is that Messiah will be a peacemaker. The world of Messiah is a world of universal peace. And that's part of the name of Messiah, Shiloh. And a second name is Yinon. What does that mean? So the commentaries tell us that the word Yinon implies dominion and monarchy. That's part of the package of Messiah. Moreover, the word Yinon is spelled with a Yud and then a Nun and then a Vav and then a Nun. The Kabbalists tell us that that word, that name, those four letters, they are built out of the ruins of our enemies. The serpent in Genesis is known as Nachash. The nun of Nachash is the word Yinon has two nuns. One of the nuns of Yinon, which is the name of Messiah, comes from the Nachash, from the serpent. The other nun from the word Yinon comes from our other adversary, the Satan. These enemies, the, the serpent, the Satan, will be broken up and out of their ruins, so to speak, will be built this persona of Messiah as manifested by the, by the name Yinon. One nun from the Nachash, from the serpent, and one from the Satan. Now there are still two letters missing, the Yud and the Vav. And they come from the word Esav. Esav, Esau, that uh, evil twin of Jacob. It's spelled Ayin, Sin, Yud, Vav. Those Yud, the Yud, Vav, that's going to be where the Yud, Vav of the word Yinon is constructed. Now, what happens if you take the word Esav and you pull out the Yud and the Vav? You end up with the word called Us. And that means to wilt and degrade. Part of the Messianic package is the elimination or certainly the defaming of the Satan, of the Nachash, of the serpent, and of Asaph. And out of that, out of those runes, Yinon, so to speak, will sprout. And that element of Messiah is hinted to with this name of Yinon. The word Chanina, it's a blend of the word Chain, which means grace, and God. Messiah will be endowed with irresistible, godly grace. And the word Menachem means comfort. Messiah will provide comfort. The word Menachem also indicates isolation. There's a part of Messiah that's completely isolated and distant from anything that we could fathom. And that is yet another attribute or element of Messiah. And finally, Messiah is like a leper, the house of Rabbi Judah the Prince. Just as Rabbi Judah the Prince suffered immeasurably, as the Talmud tells us, that quality will be featured in Messiah. Rabbi Judah the Prince, that's the family of the monarchy. That is the family of Messiah. That is the lineage of King David. Messiah is part of that family, but will also endure some degree of suffering. And that, too, is another element of Messiah. So, again, we have another definition of this word, name of Messiah. It means characteristic of Messiah. 
And when the Talmud lists five different names, that's revealing to us different, different characteristics, different elements, different aspects, different attributes and traits of Messiah. And finally, the last interpretation, which I think may be the most relevant to us, is that Messiah exists on two different dimensions. Of course, Messiah is the outgrowth of the efforts of, of humanity. We know that if we repent, for example, we could bring, bring about Messiah. If we're very righteous, Messiah will come. If we're very, very wicked, Messiah will come. The Talmud says the Messiah will come in a generation that's entirely, right, entirely righteous or a generation that's entirely wicked. So Messiah is going to be an outgrowth of our behavior. Every individual, we're told, has a point of holiness and purity and greatness that it's their mission to unearth and to actualize. And when every one of us does our individual part, we're contributing, so to speak, our, our contribution towards the collective Messiah. We may think, you know what? I'm definitely not a candidate. I know, I know my flaws well enough. I know I'm not really a candidate for Messiah. So some may argue, well, okay, it's not my job to do anything about this. Someone else will be the Messiah. And that's true. If you're listening to this, it's very, very likely that you're, you're not Messiah. Overwhelmingly likely. I apologize to be the bearer of bad news or good news. But that does not mean that you have no role to play. If Messiah is the outgrowth of a wellspring of righteousness, every little particle in that contributes towards Messiah. And if every one of us does our individual part, then the collective Messiah will be revealed. If every righteous person does their contribution, think of it as a puzzle piece. There could be 10,000 pieces in the puzzle, and one piece is not really going to make or break it, but every piece is really needed. Maybe there's 10 billion pieces. And when the puzzle is complete, that's when Messiah is revealed. That's when the collective Messiah is revealed. Each one of these sages is saying, what's Messiah? It's me. I have to do my responsibility to do my part. His name is Shiloh. His name is Hanina. His name is Chaim. Each one of them realized that they cannot shirk their responsibility to do their part, as big or as small as it may be, in trying to bring about the Messiah. If everyone realizes that they have a role to play, they have maybe a puzzle piece. Maybe it's a, a big piece. Maybe it's a small piece. Maybe it's a thousand pieces. But they have something to contribute. And they're needed. And the name of Messiah, is, it's, it's on them, really. Because there's a part of, of it that they need to play. It's a very di different way of, of living. It's not like saying, well, there's someone else who will do that job, and thank God it's not me, because I it's too much work. Sounds like a lot of work. No, no, no. That collective Messiah is going to be the outgrowth of, of the individual micro-messiahs. Oh, I like that terminology. Micro-messiahs. And each one of these sages is saying, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to say, Shiloh is the name of Messiah. It's all on me to do my part. I do my part, I've contributed my, my piece. This is a different way of thinking about it. We each have, perhaps, a little name of uh, Messiah stamped to us. Well, we also do whatever we can to make sure that we actualize our micro-Messiah. And if we all do our job and the puzzle is complete, then 
this spirit of Messiah will be infused in whoever is the right person to lead the, the final charge, so to speak. But each one of us will have contributed our portion. I think this is an important subject to ponder during these days. This is the time when we lost our greatness, our distinction, our temple. We lost the tablets. We lost our standing. But this is also the time that we focus on trying to rebuild it and restore it. On the day the temple was destroyed, Messiah was born. On the day that we are reliving it, we should try to find a way to think about what we can do to do our part. I think it's it's a fascinating thing to, to focus just as, as a matter of study. You see a teaching in the Talmud, 17% of the world, and one of them is the name of Messiah. And it's such a, it's such a mystery, and it's interesting on an intellectual basis. And I think it's it's also very intriguing to, to, to go through the study of how to how to unpack a otherwise very mysterious teaching of the Talmud. And again, we see this such a, such a variety of different interpretations. We have the Rashba who says, the themes that preceded the world are the themes that indicate the, the goal of, of the world. And the ultimate endpoint is this world of Messiah. That's the ultimate conclusion, actualization of the plan of God. That's the name of Messiah. And that preceded the world. We saw this other idea that every generation has its potential Messiah. And each, each sage that claimed that mantle was perhaps the potential Messiah of a generation. We see all these different attributes that are part of the, the messianic character profile. And finally, we have the idea of micro-Messiah. And that, I think, it's not just an idea to think about intellectually, but also to think about, especially during these times, what is my role to play? What part of this puzzle can I contribute? Each person can do something to improve the world. To improve themselves, of course, first and foremost. To improve their communities. And to do something to bring about the name of God in the world. And if you do that to the best of your abilities you're in effect saying, whatever role I have to play in this name of Messiah, my micro-Messiah role, I'm going to do it, or at least I'm going to try to do it. And I think if we all just had that attitude, we'll make a lot of progress. And hopefully, these days that we have endured so much, so much devastation and, and destruction these days, now is the time to think about, okay, what can I as an individual do to reverse this trend? And when Messiah actually does come, people will be ranked, we're told, by whether or not they were a contributor towards the ultimate bringing of Messiah or were they, God forbid, a detractor. And if we realize that responsibility and we realize that we have the ability to do it, regardless of how big or small it is, we should say, I want to do my part. And please, God, we will all be meritorious to witness this revelation of God in the world, this utopian world of, of peace, where the knowledge of God is covering the land as water covers the seabed. May these days be turned from days of suffering to days of joy from days of destruction to days of rebuilding. When Messiah does come, these days will be turned into holidays, not days of mourning and bewailing. And please, God, we should all be fortunate to witness that very soon, maybe even still this year, we can contribute towards it. And now it's time to think about what can we do do. I appreciate your attention. Send me an email, rabbiwalbejima.com. I look forward to hearing your questions, your comments, and your feedback.
Okay, who wants to go first? I'm going to take a quick stop because I need to get a tissue. I forgot to bring tissues here. So y'all just give me one minute. <laughs> Everyone wants to comment, put your hand up so that we can get you in order. I apologize. I just said, can't seem to kick this uh, congestion. I don't know. It's uh, Canadian uh, summers. Okay, who's who's? Uh, let me open up the chat here. Okay, the Talmud I was quoting. Um, uh, go ahead, Mike and Barb. I'm listening. Okay. Um... What is your opinion or your gut tell you about the time when uh, Mashiach comes, whether it be all good or all bad? That's a that's a tough. You know, I, I I can't see good people turning bad, so there's nothing but bad in the world, and it's very hard to see bad people turning good before Mashiach comes here. So what 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 is your gut say? Which way is going to go? We're in big trouble if it's a bad version of Messiah. Big trouble. You look at what the sources say, it's 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 very, very, very unpleasant. And we saw, of course, sources when we did the 13 Principles of Faith series. It, it We really want to avoid that. Really, really want to avoid that. Um, what does my gut say? I don't know. I'm not convinced. I'm not, I'm really not convinced. Hello, Rosca. The kids can only hold off that long, you know? They were pretty good during the class. Oh, look at that. Oh. Um, well, I, I suspect I suspect that uh, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure we have a good version of Messiah. That's my answer to your question. There, I, I just shared the Talmud there. I said the, the link, the Safari link. So if you want to read the, the Talmud that we uh, that we studied. And then there's the other one about the... Uh, about the um, the other one about uh, different, <coughs> excuse me, about the different uh, sages each claiming to be Messiah. I'll sum that up over here as well. It was in 98B, right? So that's my answer. I, I think that we, um, we may in fact um, I think we have work to do. That's uh, that's uh, what I'm going to say. Here we go. Here's the other one. Here we go. I, I, I don't know if that's encouraging to you. There we go. That's the second citation. Do you guys like this format where it's it's almost like a Talmud? Let's study it from different angles. Yeah. You like it on occasion? 
Okay. Israel, these are Abba's friends. You see? Yeah. No. Uh, I... Did you get your pacifier? No. No? Nope. It was up. <gasps> see, right? there's a pretty I smile. Know. I knew I could see that pretty smile. You don't want to smile nicely? Nice. See? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a boy, by the way, so don't get confused by the hair. Okay. I like it. His name is Israel. We call him Israel. Israel. Israel Mayor. And uh, he was up last night at 2. Oh. He went to my bed, right, right Israel? Something on his bed? Yeah. And the rifter was up, and she threw up. Oh, no. Up. I mean, just saying. So yeah. Family, fun always, time. You guys know that I always say that it's just so much fun to come to the Torch Center to spend time with you. <laughs> <laughs> we could read between the lines. We got it. <laughs> huh? What are you saying, Michelle? Up. Up? I don't know what he's saying. These are Abba's friends. What's this? See, Nancy has a doll. Does that look like fun? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a pacifier really yummy so uh, he, he he slept so poorly last night that he's never oh. early enough today so sweet you, know, you want an effort you want an effort really no not yet later he just wants to hang with daddy that's right but he was very good he stayed out uh, out of the room till, till the class is finished that's a good boy. It is. So sweet. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. We really appreciate it, and we hope that the rest of your trip is uh, pleasant. I booked a flight to go to Israel in a couple of weeks. Uh, my brother's making a wedding for his daughter, my oldest brother Ellie. And I really don't want to miss one of those weddings. Um, but a lot of airlines are canceling their flights because there's uh, raised heightened, heightened tensions in Israel. So we'll see what happens. But if I go, I'm going to have a replacement uh, for the class. And I'm flying on Sunday. <clears throat> but um, hope to hear only good news from Israel. Is the whole crew going or just you? Oh, just me, just me, just me, okay. just me. Well, good. They can stay back and play with their cousins. Yeah, that's right. Especially because, you know, school's starting in a couple of weeks. So, Who's excited for that? Who's excited for that? Yay! Hey, school's starting. So you excited for to to school? No. <laughs> so they still like school. Let, let them color, let them nap, let them play. Yeah. I remember we got into first grade like there was no more coloring. And I, I remember thinking, like, why did we stop that? Why? Does it make sense? I still think so. You want more coloring? Yeah. Complained? Oof. Go ahead, David. You're on mute, though. Hello. So, Rabbi, I've been thinking a lot about Mashiach lately, um, and, and I'm sure you've talked about this before, but if you could just share some thoughts about, I get so upset and distraught when I look at sort of, you know, how the world's treating Israel, anti-Semitism, the Mishigas that's going on in our politics, that I, I get really, really upset and angry, and, and the only comfort sometimes is to think well maybe this is just you know maybe this is the 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 coming of messiah <laughs> maybe this is what uh was prophesied in, in the bible and so that brings me comfort but yet i don't think i'm supposed to think that or hope for that uh well i think I'm a lot i think a lot of people from both sides of the aisle from the whole political spectrum get very disappointed with politics and um it, it, it's it's designed to make people disappointed. You know, the good news doesn't get people to vote, doesn't get people to click. So um, 
my best recommendation is to just step out in the politics. Now I'm, I'm a big talker because I still get swept into it sometimes. <laughs> uh, but I think you don't want to think about Messiah as just a way to solve all my problems. You know, I got the I got the financial problem, I got my relationship problem, problems at work, or problems in the news and the politics. And like, oh, just Messiah will solve everything. It, it may not be like as simple as that. Because Messiah might make our life more difficult. You know, we don't know. We don't know enough about it to uh to say definitively. And we don't want to kind of it, it ultimately it's all about bringing God to the world. That's what it's all about. Everything else is just a distraction. So to think about it in the context of politics or 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 other petty things, while I think it is true, because it, it is going to be a time of unprecedented peace and stability and 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 goodness in the world, that's not really what we want. Like we, when we want Messiah, we want to say it, it, there is nothing as corrupt as the fact that the entire world doesn't universally know about God. There's nothing as bad as that. It's kind of hard for us to appreciate that because we're so involved in other things. But the only true reality in the world, the only thing that's not a dependent reality, that's a true reality, is that the is, is the existence and dominion and omniscience and omnipotence of God. That's the only thing that really, 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 really endures and is true forever and ever. And 99% of the world doesn't know it. Or maybe even more. I don't know what the numbers are. And that's just a, a corruption that we want to rectify. Everything else is just, you know, it's transitory, it doesn't really matter. And the fact that we get caught up in all those things that don't matter, that, that's almost a, a reflection of the problem as, a, as opposed to the solution. Like again, I, I don't want to um, point fingers at anyone because I'm just as guilty as this as everyone else is. <clears throat> but I think on a... On a, on a on a philosophical level, that's really what it's about. And everything else, everything that's happening is trying to get our attention. To say, okay, this, the world is wrong because the knowledge of God is not ubiquitous. So I don't know if that addresses your question, but definitely it's going to be part of it. The, the world will be fixed in every possible way. Again, some of it we might not like. Because a lot of a lot of things that we like in our in our world are distractions, right? We love to be distracted. We love to forget about God. And again, I'm just as guilty as this as everyone else. I'm not uh, accusing anyone. But you know, my kids are excited about for the football season. Sundays, we gotta watch Red Zone. They're excited about that. <laughs> what? Where's God in the picture of that? Again, we're just as guilty as as that as everyone else is. But we like distractions. And we like focusing on things that don't really matter. Because only one thing matters. And everything else, either if it brings us towards that, then it's good. If it brings us away toward, from that, it's bad. So Messiah is more about shifting our understanding of existence than it is about you know fixing these individual problems in the world. We'd all be very happy to keep the world the way it is and to let you know, to, to let all of our little Michigasin, to use your word, let that continue. And uh but fix, you know, Israel and, and fix the politics and 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 fix the potholes and you know and make the internet really well really fast and and uh you know make my income very high and, and make my health very, very fit. And that that's what we want, but we're not really changing our fundamental worldview. And saying, I'm here to be a servant of Hashem. That's what I'm here to do. And everything else is everything that pulls me away from that is 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 poison. That's that's a lot harder. <laughs> that's a lot harder. And again, we're we're all guilty of this. Right, this? Yeah, there was a joke that they used to say. The people moved to, moved to America, they started making some money, and they 
were allowed to be involved in commerce and business and own real estate. And they build these big, beautiful homes in New York. Someone said to them, what are you going to do? Messiah comes. You want to move to Israel to a little, little shanty town? You know, what are you going to do? He's like, I don't understand. Hashem saved us from all the troubles. We'll save us from the, Hashem saved us from all troubles. He'll save us from this trouble as well. That's the joke they used to say. Do people get, you know, they get comfortable in, in, in their life. And Messiah is going to be a very fundamental change in, in, the, in the biggest picture of our little, life. Little man's falling asleep on you. <laughs> yeah, he's sound asleep. I thought you were going to drop him for a second. <laughs> he is out. So are you sleeping? So tired. <laughs> They're so cute. Or is he faking? Is he faking? <laughs> I know he's very tired. Yeah. Up last night, screaming at two in the morning, three in the yeah, morning. That, that head bob sure gave it away. He came yeah. to my bed and he moves. He starts sleeping horizontally. So as you wake up with this full head of hair is in your face. Right, is? Yeah. <laughs> Look, he sticks his hands in my pocket, in my shirt. <laughs> yeah. Right, is? Yeah. You want to close your eyes and go to Schlofkopf? No. The step? Yeah. This is easy easy to put him to sleep when he's in this in this state. Okay, this was uh, an absolute joy, as it always is. <clears throat> yes, I love what Pat wrote. Suppose we all quit being angry and worked on doing good. Just suppose. I like that. That would be enormous. I just pulled out the um, Ramban's letter for the ages. I started reading that. And Amazing. I, I, he's right. You have to read it once a week. I need to read it once a day. It's, it's a big <laughs> struggle not to be angry. It's, yeah. it's, it's really hard not to be angry. There's so many things to be angry about. But I think it would help if we let go of that. Well, especially because we know that anger doesn't actually accomplish anything. It doesn't. But it's I mean, somehow we feel like we are uh, gaining justice or something. Um, right. It's like we we want to fix yeah. it by being angry. And it's really hard to get away from that. Yeah, absolutely. I wish it would fix it, but it doesn't <laughs> at all. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> oh my gosh! If you could Beam just away fix our it troubles. by being angry. Oh my gosh! But somehow we have to like submit to God and and you know allow God to be the angry one. Just submit to God. Uh, I don't know. There's a sweet spot there where you feel it, but you don't act on it. It's. It's, it's a, a difficult thing. Very, very important thing to work on. Yeah. It is nice to know that in a group like this, that we're not the only ones feeling this way, that it just gets frustrating because you know we have such greater potential as a society and a world, and you just see these forces that are working. It is frustrating. It's, in, it, it's not just. It's not just. Yeah. And the way for us to do something about it is to start with ourselves. Yes. That's the big insight. <clears throat> There's a famous line from Rabbi Israel Salant there. He says, when I started off my mission, I thought I would change the whole world. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'll change just the whole country. And then, oh, maybe I'll just change the, the county or the town or the family. And then he says, ultimately, I said, I realized I could just change myself. But the truth is, you change yourself and that ripples out outwardly. That will change everyone. It is out. Now's the time to go take him and put him in bed and take a nap with him, huh? I don't feel fine. I woke up, let's see, two, three, five, six, seven. <laughs> Am I less sharp than usual? Well, about the same. Nah, if anything, you're sharper. You should get less sleep, maybe. 
Yeah. Good idea. No, your mental health's important. Get plenty of sleep. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else wants to uh, ask a question or for a comment? Don't forget this afternoon, 3, 3 p.m., Rabbi Ingber is going to be with us. Q&A sessions. Great. Have a lot of fun. Great your questions. Rabbi will be with I'm us sorry? tonight. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? You're still on schedule for Thursday night? Yes. yes. So please, God, this, this upcoming Thursday night, we're going to have our Thursday night uh, special um, this week. Uh, please, God. Again, I'll, I'll be in touch later on the week if I have to cancel. I have to cancel or postpone it. I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that. But as of right now, Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central, which is 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm looking forward. Everyone have a wonderful week. Take care. Shalom, Bye. shalom.